someone. Okay, so let's go back to the camera. Okay, so what I wanted to point out to you, as you're correcting your work, okay, so it should be like a different color. So I looked at this yesterday, I'm like, oh, line skew to FG. Okay, skew is when they're like this, they're like on a completely different plane. They're nowhere near, and this one's this direction and that one. So it says skew to FG. So I looked at FG and I'm like, okay, this line here, BC would be skew, and also AD, that would be skew. And then I went to the next one, lines perpendicular. Okay, perpendicular to this means those two signs. So I wrote AF and BG. And then lines parallel to FG. So I wrote this one down here, HE and AB up here. And plane ABCD. Well, after this section, I went and looked at the answer key because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss one, right? And that's when I noticed, oh no, why do I have two answers on each of these? Because I didn't read the directions carefully. <laughs> so I jumped into it, but I didn't actually read what it was asking. What this was asking was, which line or plane contain point B and fit the description? I just wrote fit the description. I didn't write the ones with B in them. So then I came back to my work and I said, well, you know what? AD does not. So I crossed that out. AF doesn't have a B in it. EH doesn't have a B in it. And then I wrote a note to myself. These don't contain B. So what I'm saying to you is this practice is yours. I'm not going to come along and fix your paper if you make a mistake. That's your job. But if you do make a mistake, then this will tell me that I made a mistake and pay attention to it next time. And that's what you're supposed to do. So some people are better at this than others, like correcting their mistakes. But your brain actually learns and focuses synapses a lot more on this than on just writing the answer and moving on. Believe it or not, this will help you learn more than just getting the answer and going on. Not that I want you to make mistakes, but that's really how your brain works. Okay, now the second set is just look at this diagram. So your parallel lines, remember it's the little, the little arrow there. And so you're looking for your little red arrows, of course. These are parallel. So I have that written. And also, this is a double arrow. So that just means these are also parallel. So those symbols should have shown you that they're parallel. Perpendicular is where you see this sign. So S, T, and U, V. But then if you know these two are parallel, then this is also perpendicular. That's the way they work. So that's the other set. And then it asks, is W, X parallel to Q, R? No, of course not. They go in different directions and they are not. So also it says, if you have the answer of no, it's not complete because it says explain. So if it says explain, you should have some other type of blurb here. Why not? No, they're not because they are intersecting and parallel lines never intersect. Eight is ST perpendicular to NV. So ST and V, yes. And we know that there is exactly one line through V that is perpendicular. That was our parallel postulate, excuse me, our perpendicular postulate from yesterday. Now, this one's going to take a while because this was just identifying. I'm going to zoom in a little. There were 12 corresponding angles in this picture. There are six alternate interior pairs in this picture, six in here and six in here. So just make sure you have them all. And if you're missing any, then add them. Or if you got one wrong, cross it out. If you got them all right, great.
Miss Payne, do you want us to turn in a picture of our corrected work as well? No. Not if you already turned it in. It is sort of on your honor system, of course, um, because I know you're all scholars and some of you are in different processes, but the best way um, to learn is to correct your own work, but I don't need to see it. If you already did it on time, you get credit. Um, well, I was just, I just forgot something. I'll give you another minute, hopefully, to check those off. Just making a note to myself. Okay. But what I need to know, are there any questions on what each one of these are? If you did get confused at all, if you do those flashcards in Quizlet, that'll really help. Plus, this was only our first day working with these. We're going to be working with these every single day from now on. So, you know, after two or three sections, you're going to see these again and again and again. If there was any confusion. Yay! Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I mean, it's better because if you just show up and pay attention, it pretty much sinks in every day. And there's not a lot of studying. You just got to keep it straight. So is that enough time? Does anybody need kind of more? Oh, and by the way, I'm also going to be posting this in the notebook. So if you did not have enough time or you want to look at it again, well, actually, the answers are already posted in there. I already put them in the class notebook. But I wanted you to see my work because it's easier than, than seeing the book's work. So, okay, I'm going to switch. And I'm looking at your faces. Any questions? Everybody good? All right, thank you, Lucas, for popping back up. Okay. So, section one was all identification. Like, this is what they are and recognize it. Section two, we're actually going to do theorems. So, I'm going to go straight over to theorem uh, to section two. I'm going to be showing you some examples. And I think there's five. If you have a question, pop your hand up or unmute yourself as we're going. Um, or if you want to follow along, this is on Big Ideas. So here we go. Yes. So this is section three. We heard this is parallel lines and transversals. So here's ideally what you will learn. You're going to use properties of parallel lines to prove theorems about parallel lines and solve real life problems. So we're going to do some algebra stuff and we're going to do some proof stuff. Remember, these are the vocabulary words we're looking at. You can either click on the vocabulary word when you're looking through the dynamic textbook and it will pop up. Right. It shows up with a picture and the example. Or you can just go straight to the glossary, glossary with, this, with this click. That's for those of you who don't want to check out your book. So each one of these will bring that to you. So the thing about parallel lines is once you get parallel lines in a transversal, you get these theorems, which are kind of nice because you already know where they are. So here's your picture, corresponding angles theorem. If two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, like our picture, then the pairs of corresponding angles are congruent. Yay. So in this picture, it shows that two is congruent to six and three is congruent to seven. So Matt, what's another pair that's not listed? Wait, for what? For corresponding angles. It, it says two and six are corresponding, and it says three and seven are corresponding. But there's two more pairs. There's one and five and four and eight. Yeah, exactly. And so there's a proof on page 180 in your book if you want. Look at example 36. But otherwise, it looks kind of obvious. So we're not going to go through the proof right now. You can see it if you want. Theorem 
if two parallel, parallel lines are cut by transversal, then those pairs of alternate interior angles are congruent. So just like we drew yesterday, three and six are on alternate sides of the transversal, so opposite sides, and they're between P and Q. That makes them interior. The other pair would be four and five, and that's it. There's no more. Again, there's a proof on page 134 if you want to see the proof. But we already talked about these yesterday, so this shouldn't come as a surprise. And then theorem 3.3 is talking about exterior angles. So alternate exterior means opposite sides of the transversal and outside of P and Q. So the pairs of alternate exterior angles are one and eight, as well as two and seven. You know, if you look at these, don't the small ones all kind of look like the same anyway? And the bigger angles look the same? So really, there's only two sizes of angles here if you look at it. Now, theorem 3.4 isn't exactly the same. 3.4 is about 4 and 6. So if you remember what those are called, they're called consecutive interior angles. So they're right next to each other. There's nothing between four and six, and they're between P and Q. And what that says is the pairs of consecutive interior angles are supplementary. So four plus six are a linear pair. And three and five are a linear pair in these examples. So that means we can say that the measurements are equal to 180. Again, these proofs are on page 136 example 15 and example 16. But to do your assignment, you don't really need to know the proofs. And um, you'll see them again. Let's see how the theorems are like exactly what we talked about yesterday. I'm looking at your faces for some head nods here. Yeah. And we're going to use these now to do some problems. So let's look at these examples. Um, I think I turned my microphone on, so tell me if you can't hear this girl talking. The measures of three of the numbered angles are 120 degrees. Did you hear her just say it's 120 degrees? All right, good. Yeah. Identify the angles. Thanks. Explain your reasoning. Solution. Notice that the diagram shows two parallel lines cut by a transversal, so you can use the theorems about parallel lines. The 120 degree angle and angle eight are alternate exterior angles. So by the alternate exterior angles theorem, the measure of angle eight equals 120 degrees. Next, angle five and angle eight are vertical angles. So using the vertical angles congruence theorem, the measure of angle five equals 120 degrees. Finally, angle five and angle four are alternate interior angles. So by the alternate interior angles theorem, the measure of angle four equals 120 degrees. So the three angles that each have a measure of 120 degrees are angle four, angle five, and angle eight. Another way, there are many ways to solve this example. Another way is to use the corresponding angles theorem to find the measure of angle five and then use the vertical angles congruence theorem to find the measure of angle four and the measure of angle eight. And so when you see another way, that tells you if you want to use, if you have to do a proof, there's more than one way usually, but um, there's usually a best way that's shortest. Either way, there's more than one way to do that. So second example. Find the value of X. Solution. Notice that the 115 degree angle and angle four are vertical angles. So by the vertical angles congruence theorem, the measure of angle four equals 115 degrees. Now, A and B are parallel. So you can use the theorems about parallel lines. Notice that angle four and the angle with a measure of the quantity X plus five degrees are consecutive interior angles. 
So by the consecutive interior angles theorem, the measure of angle four plus the quantity X plus five degrees equals 180 degrees. Substitute 115 degrees for the measure of angle four. Next, combine like terms on the left side of the equation. This gives you X plus 120 equals 180. To solve for X, subtract 120 from each side of the equation. This gives you X equals 60. So the value of X is 60. You can check your solution by substituting 60 for X in the equation 115 degrees plus the quantity X plus five degrees equals 180 degrees. When you simplify, you get 180 equals 180. Any questions? Okay, so you see how we're gonna set up equations and then use our algebra to solve them. Let's do another one. Find the value of X. Solution. Notice that angle one and the 136 degree angle form a linear pair. So by the linear pair postulate, the measure of angle one equals 180 degrees minus 136 degrees, which equals 44 degrees. Yeah. Now, lines C and D are parallel, so you can use the theorems about parallel lines. Notice that angle one and the angle with a measure of the quantity 7x plus 9 degrees are alternate exterior angles. So, by the alternate exterior angles theorem, the measure of angle one equals the quantity 7x plus 9 degrees. Substitute 44 degrees for the measure of angle one. To solve for x, first subtract 9 from each side of the equation. This gives you 35 equals 7x. Then divide each side of the equation by 7. This gives you 5 equals x. So the value of x is 5. You can check your solution by substituting 5 for x in the equation 44 degrees equals the quantity 7x plus 9 degrees. When you simplify, you get 44 equals 44. Okay. So I'll be expecting to see equations with work and some kind of a little check. It's kind of nice to be able to do those problems. Okay. Um, we're going to just keep going. Now what we're going to do is, so those kinds of problems, depending on what's equal, you can set them up and solve with algebra. This other kind of problem is proving theorems. So again, we're going to start with a plan. We'll like look at the picture and figure out what is it we want to prove. And then you'll do a chart. Okay, but I wouldn't expect to see like all of the plan, just maybe a little sketch. So here we go. Prove that if two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then the pairs of alternate interior angles are congruent. Solution. Draw a diagram with two parallel lines cut by a transversal. Label a pair of alternate interior angles as angle one and angle two. You are looking for an angle that is related to both angle one and angle two. Notice that one angle is a vertical angle with angle two and a corresponding angle with angle one. Label it angle three. Before you write a proof, Identify the given and proof statements for the situation described or any diagram you draw. You are given that line P is parallel to line Q. You need to prove that angle one is congruent to angle two. Write a two column proof. First, write the nation. You are given that line P is parallel to line Q. Next, angle one and angle three are corresponding angles. So by the corresponding angles theorem, angle one is congruent to angle three. Then angle three and angle two are vertical angles. So by the vertical angles congruence theorem, angle three is congruent to angle two. Finally, by the transitive property of congruence, angle one is congruent to angle two. Any questions? See how this is working? 
You can use those relationships to prove more things, and then we'll end up with even more theorems. And again, this is only a four-stepper, and it's not the only way to do it. Like, for instance, instead of three here, you could have put three here. It would have been the same thing, but when you draw the picture, you just have to realize what's what. So one more. This is, no, actually two more, I think. They're um, real life problems. Here we go. When sunlight enters a drop of rain, different colors of light leave the drop at different angles. This process is what makes a rainbow. For violet light, the measure of angle two equals 40 degrees. What is the measure of angle one? How do you know? Solution. The sun's rays are parallel and angle one and angle two are alternate interior angles. So by the alternate interior angles theorem, angle one is congruent to angle two. You are told that the measure of angle two equals 40 degrees. So by the definition of congruent angles, the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle two, which equals 40 degrees. Whenever something says, how do you know? You just have to say, I know because of this. Like, that's plenty. That's exactly the answer. By the definition of, or you could say, measure of angle one equals 40 by definition of congruent angles. Just as long as it's a little sentence. And I thought there was one more. But, nope, I guess not. Okay, so that is um, exercises 1 through 28. You're not going to do all 1 through 28, but we're going to go to big ideas. And unless you're having a specific question about one of those theorems, um, I can let you go uh, if you're ready to start on them. And remember, I'm not going to check them till at least Monday, so you can do them today or tomorrow or Sunday if you need to be. But um, that's my son. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. But uh, and it'll be in the.